I'm going to ask you please to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Tonight we read, beginning at verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are unworthy apart from Christ, to take Your Word up into our mouths, to deliver it, to speak it. Lord, such a subject we come to tonight, and we are very aware, Lord, that there's no way to convey with a sense of justice what You have recorded for us here. And so, Lord, we depend upon You and we ask You Lord, to go beyond the frailty of the vessel delivering the message and deal with our hearts and minds in a way that when we're done, we will know, Lord, unmistakably that You have dealt with us. We pray, Lord, for the lost in this place and ask that You might make them to know their sinfulness and their need for Christ. Lord, for Your people, Lord, would You help us to be ever more aware of how You have graced us, how You have shown us mercy. Help us, Lord, to grow in our appreciation, our thankfulness for who You are and for what You've done for us in Christ. Please magnify Your Son before our eyes tonight. We ask You in Jesus' name. Amen. The thousand years have been completed. Satan has led one final rebellion against God and he's been thrown into the lake of fire. And now there's only one final matter to deal with when you come to verse 11. The last day for man in God's court. The final judgment of God upon sinners. John MacArthur did a great job of capturing the significance of this judgment. He wrote, quote, It is the last courtroom scene that will ever take place. After this, there will never again be a trial, and God will never again need to act as judge. The accused, all the unsaved who have ever lived, will be resurrected to experience a trial like no other that has ever been. There will be no debate over their guilt or innocence. There will be a prosecutor, but no defender an accuser, but no advocate. There will be an indictment, but no defense mounted by the accused. The convicting evidence will be presented with no rebuttal or cross-examination. There will be an utterly unsympathetic judge and no jury. And there will be no appeal of the sentence he pronounces. The guilty will be punished eternally with no possibility of parole in a prison from which there is no escape. Close quote. What a sobering, sad, awful judgment this will be. And ever since the time of the fall until now, Satan has been at work, the father of lies, trying to convince humanity that there will be no final judgment. 
like the one that's described in these verses. And he's tried to convince man of that in a number of ways. He's tried to convince that there is no God. He does this overtly and he does it subtly. Overtly in the form of atheism, subtly in the form of humanism, evolution. All is an attempt to remove God from our thinking. He's tried to convince that there's another kind of God, one who won't judge anyone. It's not uncommon to hear unbelievers say, well, that's not my God. I don't believe in a God of wrath. I don't believe in a God who would send anyone to hell. I don't believe in a God who would judge. I wonder where those thoughts originated. Certainly in the sinful flesh, but also from the father of lies. He's tried to convince the world that there is some other way to God and some other way to heaven than faith in Jesus Christ. And again, he does this with very subtle arguments. What about those who've never been exposed to Christianity, the argument goes. What about those who live in areas of the world where they're not exposed to the gospel like we are? Certainly, God will have some sort of mercy for them, right? Certainly, there must be some other way to heaven, some other way into God's good graces and the accepting presence of God than Jesus Christ, right? Even though Jesus said Himself, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and what's the next statement? No man comes to the Father except by Me. And so in these ways and others, He's tried to convince man that there is no final accountability for sins. And that what God says about the truth that only through faith in Christ will men and women be found acceptable to Him, even though God has said that, that must not really be what God means. This is one reason why people live in their sins. They imagine that they won't have to account for it. Can you imagine what Houston, Texas would be like if today all of the laws and punishments were removed from the law book? If all of a sudden we said, no more laws, no more punishments for crimes, I wonder what the city would be like. Well, what happens spiritually when people imagine that there really is no such thing as sin, no one who defines sin, and no one who punishes sin? People live in their sins. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15 tell us that there will be a day of final accountability. There will be a day of final judgment. And John had that future day set before his eyes. There are three things I want us to see in these verses. Number one, we're going to look at the judge. We see that in verse 11, the judge. Second, we're going to look at the judged. That's verses 12 and the first part of verse 13, the judged. And in third, the judgment, verses 13 through 15. The judge, verse 11, the judged, verses 12 and 13, and the judgment, verses 13 through 15. Notice, first of all, the judge, verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. John begins by describing a throne. Great, he says, no doubt in size, but also in importance. As we said earlier, this is man's final day in God's court. A great throne, and it's a white throne, which speaks of the purity of the one who judges, the holiness of Almighty God, the justice, the true, accurate, perfect justice that will be meted out. It's a great white throne. And the one sitting upon it, who is the one sitting upon this throne? Well, the Father will sit upon this throne. The one spoken of in Revelation chapter 4, if you want to look there with me for a moment. Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, describes the Father on the throne because it was from His hand that the Son of God took the book, the scroll that was to be unleashed 
Revelation 4, verse 5, And from the throne proceed flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And in the center and around the throne four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And the first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf. And the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who sits on the throne, to Him who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders will fall down before Him who sits on the throne and will worship Him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy art Thou our Lord and our God to receive glory and honor and power for Thou didst create all things and because of Thy will they existed and were created. This is the one who sits on the throne. But especially on this throne, the focus will be on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because to Christ, the judgment has been entrusted. And we know that He sits with His Father on this throne. In Revelation 3, 21, it says, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. In John 5.21 it says, For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son, in order that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Let that sink in. In this world full of people who will acknowledge a God, but will not acknowledge Jesus Christ, one day all judgment will be given to Jesus Christ. And the lesson is all must honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Because whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. John 5.27 says, And He gave Him authority, Christ, to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. Acts 10.42 says, And He ordained us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the One, speaking of Christ, this is the One who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Acts 17.31, because He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom He has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising Him from the dead. Who will judge the world in righteousness? The One who has been raised from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see a great white throne... And the one who sits upon it is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's been raised from the dead, the one to whom all judgment has been entrusted. And then in verse 11, we're told something else. It says, from whose presence, literally from whose face, earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. In that one brief statement, do you know what we have described? The uncreation. Just as God created all things by His Word, after the millennial kingdom, the universe as we know it right now will go out of existence. God will bring into existence a new heaven and a new earth But first, the old, that which has been tainted by sin, will be taken out of existence. The earth as we know it today will be renovated. It will be changed for the millennial kingdom. The curse will be lifted. But that's still not the new heaven and the new earth. And after the millennial kingdom, the earth, the universe as we know it, will be taken out of existence by the very one who created it. Almighty God. 
In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, it is described, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. In Revelation 21, look at verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth, what? Passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He shall dwell among them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be among them. And He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Isaiah 65.17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. John MacArthur says, quote, This is nothing less than the sudden, violent termination of the universe. Psalm 102.25 says, Of old thou didst found the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Now listen, even they will perish but thou dost endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. Thou wilt change them, and they will be changed. Isaiah 51.6 says, Lift up your eyes to the sky, then look to the earth beneath, for the sky will vanish like smoke, and the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants will die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not wane. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but My Word shall not pass away. Luke 16, 17 says, But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of a letter of the law to fail. Hebrews 1, 10 says, And Thou, Lord, in the beginning didst lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of Thy hands. They will perish, but Thou remainest. And they, will, and they all will become old as a garment. Revelation 20, verse 11 says that from the face of Christ, from the face of God, earth and heaven fled away. That is, they were taken out of existence. In fact, notice the next statement, and no place was found for them. They did not exist anymore. Gone. Which, by the way, still speaks of the One who sits on the throne. Because they fly away from His presence. They fly away from His face. That is, He is the One who brought it all into being and He's the One who can cause it to all go out of being. And do you get this? He is not dependent upon it in any way for His own existence. He existed before there was any of this. And He will exist after there is any of this the uncreation prior to the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. Sitting upon the throne, sitting upon the throne is Almighty God who is dependent upon no one and nothing for His existence. The self-existent one. And He's the one who will judge. Notice not only the judge in verse 11, now notice the judged in verse 12. And I saw the dead the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. John only sees the judge, he sees the judged. And he tells us a few things about them. One, he says they are the dead. Those who've died physically. Those who are dead also spiritually in sins. Standing at this great white throne judgment are all of the lost from all ages. The resurrection of the dead will wait until the end of the millennial kingdom and they will be raised 
the dead and the sins will be raised to be judged. The great and the small will be there. People who were notorious sinners and people who were unknown in their rebellion toward God. John Phillips wrote, quote, There is a terrible fellowship there. The dead, small and great, stand before God. Dead souls are united to dead bodies in a fellowship of horror and despair. Little men and paltry women whose lives were filled with pettiness, selfishness, and nasty little sins will be there. Those whose lives amounted to nothing will be there. Whose very sins were drab and mean, spiteful, peevish, groveling, vulgar, common, and cheap. The great will be there. Men who sinned with a high hand, with dash and courage and flair. Men like Alexander and Napoleon, Hitler and Stalin will be present. Men who went in for wickedness on a grand scale with the world for their stage and who died unrepentant at last. Now one and all are arraigned and on their way to be damned. A horrible fellowship congregated together for the first and last time. Close quote. John sees that they'll be judged soul and body. You notice there in verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the, and the dead and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Notice, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them and they were judged. He mentions the sea, he mentions death, and he mentions Hades. When he talks about the sea and he talks about death, he's talking about the raising of their bodies. When he talks about Hades, uh, it is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Sheol, the realm of the dead, but in the New Testament it's always seen as a place of suffering. So you have these people without bodies, suffering, souls in Hades, bodies in the sea, bodies in the earth. That's the sea and that's death. And at this great judgment, everything gives up the lost for the purpose of this judgment. Death gives up the bodies. The sea gives up bodies. God will reconstitute and raise bodies, listen, fit for damnation. Just like we'll have bodies fit to live with God forever, in eternity in heaven, so the dead will be raised with bodies fit for eternal suffering and damnation. And the souls will be delivered from Hades, met together with these bodies fit for eternal damnation, and there they stand before Almighty God. The great and the small, all of them dead, body and soul. Notice the judgment. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every one of them according to their deeds. What will be the standard for this judgment? What will they be judged according to? One thing the Bible tells us here is they'll be judged according to an accurate and detailed account of their life. It says according to their deeds. According to their deeds. And the Bible is clear what all this will include. Men and women who are not in Christ. You understand? The reason they stand at this judgment is because they are not found in Jesus Christ. Their sins are not paid for by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Their sins have not been forgiven. And so now they stand before God based upon their deeds. 
And the Bible is clear that this will mean that they'll be judged according to their thoughts. Their thoughts will be presented as evidence against them. Romans 2.16 says, On the day when according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. God will judge the secrets of men. Luke chapter 8, verse 17 says, For nothing is hidden that shall not become evident, nor anything secret that shall not be known and come to light. They'll be judged according to the secret things. They'll be judged even according to their secret thoughts. They'll be judged according to their words. Matthew 12, 37, For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. By their actions, physical, active violations of the law of God. And their thoughts and their words and their actions and their attitudes will all be measured against the holiness of God. The standard will be God Himself. The standard will be His perfect holiness, even as we find it expressed in Holy Scripture. Matthew 5.48, Jesus says, Therefore you are to be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew 5.20, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law, and yet stumbles in one point, He has become guilty of all. And so the books will be open, and one of the books, one of the records will be the record of their life, their thoughts, their words, their attitudes, their actions. And those words and thoughts and attitudes and actions will be measured against God's perfect holiness. And they're going to all be found lacking. And so notice the judgment. Notice the sentence. Verse 14. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. They will be found guilty. Not not in Christ. Not having trusted Christ, not having their sins forgiven, standing before God based upon their deeds, they will all be found guilty. And the sentence will be that they will be cast into the lake of fire. Hades is a place of torment right now, but it is a temporary place. Hades will not last forever. You see that in verse 14. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This final judgment, the lake of fire will do away with Hades. Right now there are souls suffering in Hades, suffering torment. But the dead will be raised to stand before God, body and soul. And then after the final judgment, they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death, the lake of fire. And there they will remain forever. Do you realize right now the lake of fire is empty? It is prepared for the devil and his angels. And we find out when it will first have inhabitants. Verse 10 of chapter 20 says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. It is no temporary punishment. And it is a tormenting punishment. Verse 15 says, They will be tormented day and night. Day and night. And when you study the Bible on this issue, you find that it will be a physical torment, but it will also be a mental and emotional torment. And there will be degrees to this punishment. Don't misunderstand. It will be misery for everyone who's there. The Bible does not... I mentioned this last Sunday night. The Bible does not describe hell as lost men want to think of it. It won't be a place where you meet with your friends. It won't be a place where you have some kind of party and evil. It's a place of aloneness. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of outer darkness and torment. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, the Bible says, will be there. 
Yet, though it will be misery for everyone, the Bible indicates it will be more miserable for some than others. Matthew eleven twenty one. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You shall descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. The Bible indicates where there's greater light, there's greater accountability. And even in a place of eternal punishment, God's justice will be perfect. The punishment will fit the offenses. There's another way these will be judged, a way that tells us of those who are delivered. You see it again, look at verse 12. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And this day there was a book in every city of, made up of the names of its citizens. And those who will be judged in this way, those who will be thrown into the lake of fire, are those who are not recorded as citizens of heaven. Those who are not recorded as being the children of God. And I want to show you something wonderful and marvelous about those who have been recorded in the book of life. Look at Revelation chapter 13. And look at verse 8. And to all who dwell on the earth, will worship Him, talking about the Antichrist, everyone whose name has not been written, what does the Bible say? From the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and to go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth will wonder whose name has not been written in the book of life. When? From the foundation of the world. When they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, it says, "...and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The record of the citizens of heaven, the record of those who belong to the family of God. And child of God, do you realize your name was written there before the foundation of the world? Once again, we're reminded of God's glory, aren't we? And His sovereignty is His glory. Why have we been delivered? Why will we not face this judgment if we know Christ? Because our sins have been paid for in full by the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 5.24, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, He who hears My Word and believes Him who sent Me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. And does not come into judgment. The only judgment that we will face after life on this earth, if you're a believer, the only judgment you'll face will be a judgment of your works for the purpose of reward. It will be a positive judgment. You will not be judged for your sins. Your sins were judged at the tree. 
You've passed out of judgment, out of death into life. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says that we wait for His Son from heaven whom He raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Man's last day in God's court. No more judgment after this. You know, such a monumental thing. You would think there would be some long, extended description and explanation. It's not what you find here, is it? It's short. It's straightforward. It's simple. And I think we do it harm and injustice if we do anything other than what I want to do tonight, which is to present it short and simple and straightforward. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you trusted Him for the forgiveness of your sins? Have you passed out of death into life? Have you been made a new creation, a new creature in Christ? When you think about eternity, when you think about the desire to be in heaven one day, where is your trust? Is it in Christ alone? His righteousness? His finished work? Or are you placing some confidence in your deeds? Do you want to stand one day before a great white throne and Him who sits upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven will fly away, the One who can exist when all of the universe goes out of existence, the One whose standard will judge all things, a standard of absolute holiness and perfection, do you want to stand before Him one day trusting in your deeds? Because I say to you on the authority of Scripture, you will be found guilty. You will be found wanting. You will be found as a violator of the law of God. And you will be cast forever, body and soul, to a place of eternal torment. But the good news is this. God offers salvation to you even tonight if you will repent of your sins and place your trust in Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And if you know Christ tonight, oh, how we ought to be humbled to the dust because we cannot claim that we belong to Christ because we were smarter than someone else or had a softer heart than someone else or were raised in a better family than someone else because what we find is our name was written in a book before we were ever born. And Almighty God in His glory saved you, reached out and He saved you, when if He had left you to yourself, you saw no need for yourself to be saved. If He had left you to yourself, you would have never pursued Him. But He saved you. Oh, how we ought to be full of thanks and praise to Him for what He's done. And all God's people would say, Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads together, please. I read that first sermon in the book of Acts. Peter declares the glory of Christ and the glory of God and the sinfulness of man and the accountability that man has before God and I read of people who were pierced to the heart and they said, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptized, which is just to say repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And your sins will be wiped away, forgiven. And perhaps in this place tonight there's a troubled soul. The Lord has been dealing with your heart maybe long before tonight. 
And you know you're lost and you know you need Christ. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and right now, your sins will be wiped away. You'll be forgiven. You'll be saved. And then own the Lord Jesus Christ publicly. And follow Him publicly in baptism as evidence of your faith. Father in Heaven, Lord, thank You for Your saving grace. Thank You for Your mercy. Thank You, Lord, for the great offer of salvation that You've given us the authority and the responsibility to declare. Thank You, Lord, that those of us who've trusted in Christ by Your grace, Lord, we can know that our sins have been forgiven and that we stand accepted by You. Not because of our deeds, but precisely because we no longer trust in our deeds. We trust in Your Son and His perfect righteousness. Lord, may You seal this message to the hearts and minds of sinners tonight, working in them to bring them to Your Son. And Lord, may You seal these words to the hearts of Your people that we might be full of thanksgiving for who You are and for what You've done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.